Thank you very much. Uh, we're play, we're pleased to be here. Uh, John Sager and myself, Kevin Jones, uh, we, we rate about 200, there's 275 golf courses within our jurisdiction. That's Washington and Northern Idaho. And uh, uh, we set a schedule out about every 78 years to rate every golf course based on the USG course rating system. But before we get into the details about how a golf course is rated and give you those specifics, we want to show you a quick video that was done about three years ago by the USGA. They came out to us and had our team uh, uh, video uh, doing a little bit of a, a, a rating seminar at Chambers Bay right before the 2015 US Open. So uh, let's take a look at that and then we'll get into the specifics about course rating. Hi, I'm Scott Heisman, Assistant Director of Handicap and Course Rating Administration. Today we're out here at Chambers Bay Golf Course, site of the 2015 U.S. Open. At the USJ, we get a lot of questions about course rating, and today we're going to show you what it's all about. There are 10 obstacle factors rated on a scale of 0 to 10, with 0 meaning the obstacle does not exist, and 10 meaning the obstacle is a significant factor on the whole. Here at Chambers Bay, there are a few obstacles that do not come into play, such as water hazards and trees. We have the one lone tree on the golf course here. But other obstacles, such as bunkers and extreme rough, more than make up for it. The course rating procedure involves rating the golf course for both a scratch and bogey golfer, and how the various obstacles affect each player. The state and regional golf associations play a critical role in the course rating procedure. Today, the Washington State Golf Association is out here to show us how it's done. First thing we do is evaluate what we see out there from the tee area. On each hole, the team stands on the tee to determine the difficulty of the tee shot for the bogey and scratch golfer. There is an unusual pot bunker to the left. It'll be interesting to see what some of the depths of these bunkers are once we get down there. The team then moves to the landing zones of the bogey and scratch golfers. Here we are at the uh, scratch golfer's landing zone, and we are looking at the uh, width of the fairway. And then we check the rough height to see how easily it is to play out of. Finally, the team moves to the green to evaluate the obstacles around the green and measure the dimensions of the green. The team should determine the green speed using the stint meter and evaluate the contour of the green. So you've got a pretty small target up there left or right. But you see this pot bunker over here, that's pretty deep pot bunker, so we're going to have an E adjustment. That's E for extreme. After the rating is complete, the state or regional golf association will calculate their ratings based on the numbers collected by the team and then review and issue the ratings to the club. I think this is a very tough hole. They're going to have a tough time playing into the prevailing wind here. The USGA handicap system would not be able to function without the support of the state and regional golf associations and their dedicated course rating volunteers. Their work ensures that golfers of all skill levels can compete together on an equitable basis for the enjoyment of this great game. So we hope you enjoyed that short video. It was a, it was a fun day to have the USGA come out and rate the golf course right before the Open. Uh, it was definitely in fine season, ready for the Open. So we got some interesting numbers, as you can imagine, as that golf course pit very tough during the Open. So what is course rating? So essentially, what we're trying to do is, uh, there's two elements there. There's, there's measuring of a golf course, and then there's obstacles. And both those come together to create a basically a fair and equitable system so that when you post a score to your, your, your gym system or any other handicap system, that it, it creates a value to create a level playing field for all of you to play against. So the handicap system can't exist without the course rating system. That's what we do out there uh, every seven to eight years on each golf course. So the key to uh, course rating frankly, is accuracy and consistency. The USG course rating system is designed for any golf course within the, the world, frankly. So even though I rate a way, certain way and look at a, a value or a tree differently here, it needs to be rated in the same way somebody in, in Kansas City or in New York City. It doesn't matter where you are in the world or in this country, you're looking for accurate consistency because everybody uses the same system. All right, so what are we talking about here today? So what we are specifically referencing is the rating and slope. And so in this example, 69.6, 135. So it has a course rating of 69.6 and a slope rating of 135. 
What we are not talking about today is the handicap holes. The handicap holes are actually created by your own club. It is not done by us, the Washington State Golf Association. Now, we do provide that assistance to our clubs, but what we do is specifically the rating and slope number. Okay, let's talk about measurement. Uh, measurement is probably the most critical element to course rating. Uh, it is so critical that what we have done, we've been kind of taking a proactive approach to our golf course is that we kind of invested in this GPS device you see holding my hand here a year ago. This thing will actually take you where you are on earth within inches of your spot. And what's that's critical about that is that we need to know our yardage is down to the very inch. And it's important because it's such a critical element in creating that final number of rating and slope. Uh, so what we are doing now is starting last year, we are going around and remeasuring uh, re L275 golf courses in our jurisdiction. We accomplished 47 last year and we hope to get about 80 done this year. So, I've got a question for you and I've got a little bit of a prize. So I got this WSA canister here. Can anybody take a guess on what percentage yardage and measurements plays in the yard, into your rating and slope as a total? Just looking for a guess, what percentage? 40, no. 5% no. Get me closer. What's that? What percentage? I'll take that. It plays in about 90% of your yardage and your slope. If you want to come up here and take some canister. So, that's why we are going out there and measuring our golf, remeasuring them. Now, yeah, most of the times our scorecards are accurate, but sometimes they're not. So what's important is that we have the correct information in our own offices so that when we go rate a golf course, we're not basing it based on the scorecard that's given to us. We're basing it on the measurements that is done officially by our association. 90% is a lot. Now keep in mind, you're probably thinking, okay, well, if measurement makes up 90% of your rating and slope, that only leaves 10%. That doesn't seem like much, but it really is. Think about it. If the rating of the golf course was 70 strokes, 10% is seven strokes. And that makes up the other part when we go out and visit and, and, and look at those obstacles, which John is gonna get into, seven strokes matters a lot to you. I mean, you want every stroke you can get out there. So what we do out there is critically important, but measurement is the first starting point to that. Also key here, is we're always looking for monuments on the golf course. But what's odd about this picture is that this monument is on the back half of the tee. So it's really hard to get a correct measurement out of this golf course if the monument is on the back because where are you going to tee off from? You're not going to tee off from the very back of that tee box. You're going to tee off from mostly in the center part. So when we measure a golf course, this golf course is obviously trying to maximize the yards of the golf course, but we're going to be measuring from up front of that because we know that that's the true yardage of the golf course and where they're going to put their tee markers. All right. Beyond from just general measurements, there's some other factors that can effectively increase or reduce the yardage of a golf course, and we're going to go through some of these. So the first one is roll. When you guys hit a tee shot out there, the general assumption is that ball rolls ten, uh, 20 yards on a given shot. That sits under normal playing conditions. Now, obviously, if you hit an upslope or a downslope, your ball may go further or, or shorter than what the topography shows you out there on this you know, level playing field. So, uh, what we got to get there is that we we, uh, we rate our roll factors out there based on what are, what are we seeing? Are we seeing upslope? Are we seeing downslope? Will the golfer get more or less yards? is out there on the golf course. Elevation. Obviously, you know, tee to green, where we going up or down. Also, elevation, if you are uh, playing in higher elevation golf courses, the ball's getting, you know, thin air, uh, heavier air, those play into it as well. Dog like force layup. So there's situations where it may be, you know, advantageous for the golfer to cut a corner. Or maybe there's a water hazard that their ball would end up in. We actually got to bring the golfer back. So to effectively bring more yardage to the golf course for that player, which would effectively raise the rating. Win. 
we don't see a whole lot of wind factors in our golf courses in, in the state of Washington. The most we see uh, actually is in Ellensburg. Ellensburg's got the highest wind rate. So we were just out at Ellensburg Country Club last year, and we definitely had to factor it in. You get amazing how much the ratings went up because the average wind speed was about 14 to 15 miles an hour, which had an enormous effect on the golfer out there. And so the ratings do get fluctuate by wind. And then lastly, altitude. Not a big deal here, some on the east side, we see uh, altitude really becomes a play when it's above 2,000 yards. That's when you get thinner air, the balls start traveling further. You can only imagine what they see at the Colorado Golf Association. They've got golf courses that are 8,000 feet up. So the ball flies. And so they've got to make those adjustments when they're rating the golf course. All right. So this is our uh, general shot table. And so these are the assumptions that the USGA gives us on how far the scratch and bogey golfer hits the golf ball. So as you can see here, the scratch male golfer hits a tee shot at 250 yards. Now you're probably saying, what's the deal here? Scratch golfer is bombing at 320. You see that all the time on television. Well, the USGA does millions of dollars of research on this. And the reality is the golf scratch golfer on average doesn't hit as far as you see on television. So what we do here is that scratch golfer hits their tee shot 250 yards and any subsequent shot after that is 220. For the scratch women golfer, they hit it 210 off the tee and then 190 subsequent shots after that. For the bogey golfer, they hit the, the boat golfer will hit it 200 yards, male will hit it 200 yards off the tee, and then 170 yards subsequent. And then the lady, will hit, uh, bogey golfer, will hit it 150 off the tee, and then 130 yards subsequent off that shot. So what does this mean? So what we've got to do as Raiders, start at the tee box and work our way to the green. So based on those yardages, we've got to figure out where is our technical landing zones. So based on those yardages, we will go to this landing zone. So in this example, those red boxes represent the landing zones for the scratch and bogey golfer. And we will go to those zones and I observe all the obstacles that end up in those zones. And that's how we rate a golf course. So we look at the landing zones and then work our way up to the green and observe all the obstacles that are around the green. From there, we collect that data which goes into whole data, which is in our guides, which John will get a little bit into, and then that raw data is then put into a computer program to give us the rating and slope. Also, things to keep in mind, uh, a lot of times we will see golf courses incorrectly marked. Here's a very good example. That's a, a shed, and they've marked it as a water hazard. I don't see any water. So what that should be is marked as out of bounds or just as regular play. So when we go out there, we rate golf courses how we correctly see it, not because of how they have marked it. And then lastly, when we rate a golf course, we are rating based on mid-season conditions. As John will say, and he says this to all of our raters, we're looking at July 4th at noon. So we were looking at the height of the season. So even though we rate golf courses generally from May to September, we are, we are rating it based on the high season at the prime conditions. So one other thing to touch base on is that this is kind of a general diagram about how we get to from a rating to our slope. The rating is based on what the scratch golfer should be shooting on that golf course. That's what the rating means. But also the slope is basically a general line. We're going back to high school math here. That is slope over it's a rise over run. So as you get more as your handicap index increases, how many course handicap strokes are you going to get? You're going to go up a trend here. So what we're doing here is that when we rate for the scratch and bogey golfer, here on the left hand side, you know, we've got a, either a rating of 70 or 71, 72, whatever it may be, but that's matched up with what the bogey rating is, something you don't normally see. We have it published, but what more interesting you guys want to know is the slope rating. So if we were to use these as examples of what the bogey rating would be, 95 or whatever it may, what you will see is based on that calculation, you will get these course, these slope ratings. So based on that red line, the rating is 70, and because of the bogey rating being 91, that equals out to a, court, a slope rating of 113. 
113 is actually the standardized slope rating for any given golf course. That's the standard line. But it can actually range anywhere from 55 to 155. All right, so I'm gonna turn it over to John Sagner. He's been in the business for many, many years doing ratings. He's considered a master course rater, and he's gonna uh, talk to you about the obstacles on a golf course. Thank you, Kevin, great job. Uh, as Kevin said, the uh, effective playing length of the golf course is really the most important thing, and uh, it is really important that we get the right yardage. We also, as he said, we've got about 10% of the rating is based on obstacles, so we're going to show you the obstacles here. We've got topography, fairway, green target, recovery and rough, bunkers, out of bounds, water hazard, trees, green surface, and psychological. Believe it or not, there is an obstacle called psychological. We are rating these obstacles on a scale of one to ten, with uh, one being low, or actually zero to ten. Zero means it's not even on the hole. For example, when you saw the video from uh, Chambers Bay, we actually had uh, the water rating on every hole was zero because there are no water hazards there. Uh, the tree rating was actually zero, even though there was one tree there, but it was behind the tee. And uh, unless you hit a tee marker and had it shoot back over your head, the tree never came into play. But uh, four is average on a scale of uh, one to ten. Generally, the obstacles, the closer they are to the center of the fairway or the center of the green, the higher the values are going to be. Topography. What this is, is it is a evaluation of the stance problem when you're hitting your shot to the green. Uh, do you have a, a stance problem like the stage, which is a minor problem? Are you going uphill or are you going downhill? So we actually have a table for every one of these obstacles. Uh, we match that up, for example, if we know we're going 10 feet uphill, a minor problem, I can tell you we're going to get a 1 for topography. But we will show you one table here a little bit further down. It will give you an idea of what we're doing. Fairway, what this is, it's the evaluation of the difficulty of keeping the ball in the fairway from tee to green. Does that fairway tilt from right to left or left to right? Uh, and they're based on how wide is the fairway at each one of those landing zones. So when Kevin showed you the hole that had the uh, four red landing zones, we're going to go there and we're going to measure the width of the fairway. It's also based on the hole length. So for example, if we have a fairway that's 30 yards wide and the hole's 300 yards long, we're going to get a lower obstacle value than if we have the same width fairway and the hole happens to be 500 yards long. And we're looking to see if there's anything nearby that might uh, affect us hitting the fairway. This is probably the most important obstacle of the bunch. This is called green target. It is an evaluation of hitting the green with the approach shot. And they're based on the size of the green. So basically what we're doing to get the size of the green is we're going to find out how wide the green is and how deep the green is. So for example, if it's 30 yards long by 20 yards wide, we're going to add those together for 50 and divide it in half. And so our effective uh, green size would be 25. We also want to know how long is that shot into the green. Obviously, obviously, if you have a 100-yard shot into the green, you're going to get a lower green target number than if you have a 150-yard shot. We're looking at the green surface. Is it firm or is it soft? Uh, I can tell you that in all the golf courses I've rated in the state, the only time I've ever used the firmness uh, adjustment here is the year that Sahali hosted the PGA Championships. And I actually went out to the golf course seven times in one summer, and I kept re-rating the golf course as it progressed. As the rough grew up, the greens got firmer and faster, but uh, very rarely do we ever use anything like that. 
If we had greens that were extremely soft, we would also make a, an adjustment for that. And the only time we've ever done that, and we've, we've actually got a hole at a uh, golf course in uh, Queen Ellen called Sun Country. The hole's 150 yards long, it goes downhill 150 feet. Golf balls come off that tee and they bury into the middle of the green, but generally we don't do much with the uh, firmness. Also, can you see the surface when you're playing from the fairway? Obviously, if you can't see the surface, it's harder to, to judge it. This is what the table, uh, the green target table looks like. And what we have, it's a two-sided table on the left-hand side. You can see it says scratch golfer. On the right-hand side, you can see it says bogey golfer. So for example, if we have a 150-yard par three, um, and let's say the green size is 25, so we're in this column, 150 yards from scratch mail, gets a four, 150 yards for the bogey mail, gets a six. You notice that the numbers are totally different. Well, the bogey golfer doesn't hit it as far, and doesn't hit it as straight. So what we would enter on our sheet is we would enter four for the scratch, six for the bogey. The greater the differences we have after we've put all this into the computer, the higher the slope rating is going to be. Recoverability and rough. What this is, is if you happen to miss the fairway or the green, we're trying to evaluate how difficult it is to recover from missing those. And it's based on the green target to start with. Remember I mentioned the green target is the most, I think it's the most important obstacle because it also drives the rough recovery number. It will also drive the bunker number. And we look at the height of the rough. And you notice in red here, we talk about having the wrong rough height. So for example, let's say we came out and rated your golf course and we looked at the rough and we thought it was an inch and a half long. Well, maybe the golf course changes their maintenance practices the following year, and it now goes up to just over two inches. We know that right then, the mistake in the course rating is six tenths of a shot and six low points. So it's important that the golf course continues to maintain it in a condition under which we rate it, or those ratings are going to be wrong, and your handicap's going to be wrong. Bunkers. They're based on, like I said, the difficulty of the green target, so we've got to get the right green target. And then we're looking at the fraction of the green surrounded by the bunkers and the difficulty of recovering from them. For example, right here, you can see a soft face bunker. This is a lot more difficult to recover from than normal bunkers. Also, that bunker is deep. We're going to assume all the time that the bunkers are three feet, less than three feet deep for men and two feet deep for women. We make no adjustment, but once it gets over those numbers, now we have to adjust our bunker numbers up. Out of bounds and extreme rough. It's an evaluation of how it comes into play. And they're based on, like we said, the distance from the center of the fairway and the landing zone. Thick fairway or green. The shot length of the target, and if you happen to happen to have to carry it. And there are conditions sometimes where the ball, say you have a hard pan next to it, the ball will actually go out of bounds easier or quicker if you have a hard pan next to it. Also, maybe you have a fence that's protecting because you're going along the driving range. Well, you would reduce your out of bounds number because your chance of going out of bounds is, is not as great. Water hazards. And it's also, an, like everything else, an evaluation of how it comes into play. Water hazard ratings are based on uh, the distance of the water hazard uh, from the center of the landing zone of the green, the shot length of the target, and whether you need to carry a water hazard. Trees, and this is the most uh, discussed obstacle of all, 
and in the Pacific Northwest, I think you can agree, we have a lot of trees compared to Arizona, or if you go down to Palm Springs. Um, my saying has always been, low number of trees, low slope. High number of trees, high slope. Each one of the 10 obstacles that we have have a different weighting factor. And I know that trees for men, for the scratch golfer, are weighted at 9%. For the bogey, they're rated at 14%. And out of all the obstacles, that's the largest difference between the bogey and the scratches trees. Uh, the bogey golfer will hit into the trees, and they will try a miraculous recovery shot. They'll play ping pong in the trees. And as it says here, trees are generally less of a factor on a one-shot hole, and that's a par three. Green surface. What this is, is an evaluation of the contour of the green, but also the step meter reading. And you saw that in the USJ video of them uh, rolling the ball off the step meter. But you also see our rating team here. And what we do is we roll three golf balls off at one direction, find out the average how, of how far it rolled, and roll three more back the opposite way and get an average. And you can see right here, we were obviously posing for this because that's less than three feet. I don't think you're going to see any greens in the state that are three feet on the step meter. And psychological, what this is, is actually an accumulation of everything else that you've come up with on every hole. But uh, this is actually uh, done automatically by the software we have. So anytime we have an obstacle of rate, rated greater than four, there's a very good chance that the psychological is going to come into play. We also give an automatic two points for psychological to the first hole of the day and an automatic two points to the last hole. Any, any questions? Any questions? Yes, sir. Height and rough. Right, the rough height, so um, let's discuss rough. Anything below four inches for women and six inches for men, we're going to rate as rough. Anything higher than four inches for women or six inches for men, we're going to rate that as actually lost ball out of bounds. And once you hit it in that high rough, it's lost and you can't play it. But we've got a different table for rough where, I mean, if the rough is less than two inches, you get one value. If it's two to three inches, you get another value. Three to four, you get another value. So it's important that we get the correct information from the golf course and that we also, if we, you know, if they tell us that the rough is two inches long and we see that it's actually an inch and a half long, we're going to talk to them and ask them. Did what we saw today, is that how this golf course plays on July 4th? And they said, no, it's usually a little bit longer. Then we'll kind of up what we saw. Yes, sir. If a, like I said, we're trying to do it on a seven to eight year cycle. If they've made some changes, if we, somebody tells us they have, or maybe they call us from the golf course, we will definitely go out before that seven or eight year. Okay. Yes, sir. For the fence, uh, the driving range fence, that if the fence is out of bounds, you don't get relief. If it's in bounds, you do. But uh, it does keep a ball from going out of bounds if that fence is there, you know. You get relief. Um, USDA gives you relief without penalty. 
you do not get relief from a fence that's out of bounds. So if the stakes, remember on that uh, that picture, you had the, uh, look like the maintenance shed with red stakes along it. Think about those stakes being white, okay? If your ball, and you're a left-handed golfer, and so you're going the way the picture was, and your ball's barely in bounds, and you're a left-handed golfer, and you can't take a stance because actually that fence is out of bounds, you don't get relief from that. So the only time you get relief from things like that is if the ball's in bounds, or both of you are in bounds there. No. Okay. Yes, sir. So with, with using the uh, GPS device to measure now, are you finding changes in distance yeah. or uh, yeah. the, G, the GPS, it is interesting. Yeah. Um, we actually have one, uh, our problem is going to a golf course and seeing if they have in-ground markers to start with, okay, permanent markers. We have found that the golf courses that do have in-ground markers for every set of tees, so for example, maybe you got four sets of tees in the golf course, we need four in-ground markers to measure them. Those are coming out more consistent than we go to a golf course. We actually had two this year that I know of. The first one we did, and actually one that I did over in Lewiston, all they had was a post in the middle of the tee, and it had red, white, and blue yardages on it. And I can tell you the one in Lewiston was off almost 800 yards in the blue tee. Uh, oh, 500 for the eight, 500 for the blues and 800 for the whites. Okay, so it's important that we know how long that hole is because, like Kevin told you, 90 per, at least 90% of the USG or the course rating for both the bogey and strat is yardage. Okay, measured plus all those other things that you showed you the altitude and stuff. So it's vitally important that we get that correct. Does that answer that? Yeah, and, and to add to that also, uh, when you're measuring a golf course, uh, technically you're supposed to be ready from point A to B, no uh, difference for slope. So basically from a bird's eye view. So what we're finding in general is that when we re-rate a golf course, even though John had done in the past using old conventional weights, which are still good, is that in general all rate, uh, yardages are coming down. They're getting smaller because there's no effect for that or slope anymore. So when I go measure a golf course, on general, I'm seeing a, a, a shrinkage of about 50 to 100 yards off the total yards for any given set of tees. Does that kind of answer what's your question? Anything else? Anything else? Center of the tee, to the center of the fairway, to the center of the green. Yeah. We've actually had courses that have asked us to uh, measure the golf course. You saw the one picture show with the, the uh, permanent markers at the back of the green. We've actually had one, at least, that wants us to also give them the yardage to the back of the green. And that's what they were based their score, that's what they based their score points on. And that's not what we're going to do. Yeah. We're going to do what's right for everybody. Yeah. So if you really want official measurements, come to our website because those are the official yardages. Uh, the reality is sometimes golf courses like to, they want to be over 7,000 yards, but the reality is they are not. Because they're using, like he said, the back of a tee, back of green to get that by namesake. When we measure a golf course and you go to our website, it's going to be the official yardage and that is the only yardage we will use when we're rating a golf course. So T box? T by, by T, that is correct. Whatever the official spot is. Yep. Any other questions? Yeah. Hey, thank you for coming right, out. Thank today. you. Appreciate it.